This is Duke University. Our first speaker is uh, Professor uh, Shamil Edin from uh, UNC. And uh, Shamil's interests focus on uh, modern Middle Eastern history and modern Asian history uh, with an emphasis on international and intellectual history of the Ottoman Empire and the uh, Japanese Empire. Uh, among his uh, many uh, publications are a book on the politics of anti-Westernism in Asia, visions of world order in pan-Islamic and pan-Asian thought, um, which came out in 2007. He wrote also a global intellectual history. And um, I do still remember his presentation, uh, which gave rise now to a book on Japan. Uh, the book came out in 2013, Tumultuous Decade, Empire, Society, and Diplomacy in 1930s Japan. And today, uh, uh, Professor Edin is going to talk to us about uh, the impossibility of the millet system in the age of active publics, Ottoman Tanzimat, imperial citizenship, and cosmopolitan pluralism. Professor Edin, please. Thank you, Malachi, and, uh, and thank you all the centers who sponsored and all the organizers who uh, nicely coordinated this event. It's a, a great opportunity for me to meet some good friends here um, and also to share some of our uh, recent research on this question of um, empires, diversity, and nationalism. Um, so today I wanted to uh, look at uh, the Ottoman millet system, the uh, kind of not very unique, um, but in many ways, uh, let's say, peculiar way of managing diversity in one of the most uh, diverse empires in world history uh, for about 600 years, and to kind of discuss why the millet, the millet system failed in the late 19th century when it was actually most cherished. It was being institutionalized and promoted by the modernizing um, Ottoman state. And this will lead us to this question of the, the viability of the empires. What happened to all these diverse big empires from Mongolians to uh, Mughals, Safavids, and also the British uh, uh, European empires in, in, in many ways. And is there anything about modern uh, technologies of globalization like steamships and telegraph that actually created such uh, strong active publics that um, couldn't be compatible with the notion of a millet system, which actually demarcates different ethnic and religious groups under a, a universal monarch. And that would be my argument, to say that millet system ideally requires a vision of empire and, and a sacred kingship, an almost messianic sacred kingship, that has vertical links with the monarch, uh, but doesn't uh, assume that different uh, ethnic or religious groups uh, interact with each other very strongly. Also, different ethnic and religious groups have global links with each other. Um, and in some ways, I will try to kind of tell the story of the rise and the success, but then also the failure of the Ottoman millet system, um, not as a unique Ottoman failure, but also as a sign, as a symptom of the failure of all empires um, and, 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 and this kind of tragic transition to nationalism, which may even be a bigger failure, but we, we are not there yet. So I will start with, um, uh, uh, with, with, with a kind of morally reversed uh, assumption about the Mongolian Empire and the Genghis Khan. Um, in the 19th century, uh, they had a very bad reputation. Um, so if you want to criticize any monarch as being really oppressive, you will always compare him to Genghis Khan. So Abdul Hamid II was called uh, Genghis Khan with the telegraph. Uh, Stalin was called Genghis Khan with the telephone. Um, uh, and then uh, uh, British Empire is called the, uh, the Mongolians with the steamship in, in, in kind of as, as, a, as a discourse of critique. But now that we know that the Mongolians were actually the first who created this, uh, this amazing global system of imperial diversity management, um, then these judgments would, could also look like a, a compliment, right? You know, if you, uh, is it, why is it that you have a negative impressions of, of, of Genghis Khan? But I will say that my argument is that you could not be the Genghis Khan with the telegraph and the telephone because telegraph, telephone, and the steamship itself actually prevented four of these great monarchs 
um, including Catherine the Great, who actually kind of emulated the Ottoman Empire in terms of instituting Russia's own millet system. Um, even though we kind of attribute enlightenment ideals and Catherine's, um, uh, Catherine de Grey's uh, reforms that, that made being Muslim okay in Russia, I do think that there is an element of, of, a, of a kind of Ottoman reverse millet system in, in this attempt. But anyway, my argument is that because of telegraph um, and telephone and the steamships, these um, monarchs could not uh, repeat or um, emulate the successes of Genghis Khan. But then who was Genghis Khan? I will say Genghis Khan... I think Genghis Khan's Mongolian Empire um, created the most perfect millet system in many ways, uh, because in these large domains of the Mongolian Empire, what they were doing um, is to treat each and every religious tradition, including non-Abrahamic, non-monotheistic ones like shamanism and Buddhism, as a separate domain that is given freedom and respect in, in its own ways. So the Mongolian um, system uh, in some ways uh, is, is one of the most successful attempts of managing diversity in a large empire, which came with one, um, one rule, is that within that large diversity, of course, every different religious group, so if you're Muslim, Christian, Jew, actually they also um, uh, classified that way, the Muslims, Christian, Jews, Buddhists, and shamans. Um, they all have to then respect the sacred messianic, universal rulership of Mongolian ruling family. I mean, it, it, as long as we accept that, um, there is no um, limits to your freedom, that you, you have the freedom as long as you, you respect Kublai or uh, Genghis or, 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 or the later successor of Genghis Khan. Now, we see the, uh, how the Mongolian notions of the millet system interacted with the Muslim tradition of um, tolerance and diversity for the people of the book in, in, in an amazing transition in Iran where uh, a descendant of Genghis Khan, uh, Mongolian uh, Ilhanid ruler, um, Ghazan Khan, um, converted to Islam, which happened um, around uh, 1300. Um, and uh, Mongolians um, came to the predominantly Muslim uh, Middle East and in that context, uh, they were fighting with the uh, Mamluks in Egypt, uh, kind of another Muslim, Muslim dynasty. And uh, in, after the first and the second, after the first big wars, and the, before the second war, uh, grandson of Genghis Khan, decide, uh, he decided to convert to Islam, which is a very important turning point in the Mongolian um, history. Um, his conversion to Islam, of course, what, what it did is that it increased immediately his legitimacy among the Muslim uh, publics of Syria, Iraq, uh, and even Egypt. Uh, there was a big discussion is that, you know, why should we fight with this person who is no longer um, an idol worshiper? He is a Muslim. Um, he actually wanted to send a, a delegation of gifts to Mecca. He did uh, announce his Muslim conversion in, in Damascus which then completely uh, destroyed the Mongol uh, Mamluk propaganda, that you know, we are fighting for, for the Muslim dignity. And in, in that context, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah uh, wrote a refutation of Ghazan Khan's uh, conversion to Islam, um, which doesn't mean that it wasn't accepted as a, as a kind of legitimate uh, Muslim conversion. I mean, the Mongol, Mongols remained as Muslim. We know that behind this later on. Um, in that refutation, Ibn Taymiyyah says, you know, uh, what kind of, of, of a Muslim are you that you treat a shaman priest at the same level of Muslim ulama? He says, you know, we can't, we can't really do that. You know, in some ways, he's, he's challenging um, Ghazan Khan uh, on that level. And Ghazan Khan's responses are equally um, strong. It's, it's, it's mixing Mongolian universalism with the Muslim theological debates. And in, in many ways, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah was working for the Mamluk. So if he, were, if he was working for the in Hannes, you could have come up with a similar uh, juridical arguments um, on, on behalf of, uh, of, of the Ghazan Han. But we could see in Ghazan Han's conversion a kind of a merger of two different uh, traditions of managing diversity, two different millet systems. One of them is the Muslim Abbasid one, and the other one is the Mongolian universalist uh, one. And these two could have been compatible in, in some ways. You know, what it does is that it kind of updated uh, an, an art of imperial management of diversity in 
Eurasia by, uh, by telling, for example, the Muslims in Syria that there are Buddhists there, there are shamans. There are people who, whose religion is really not familiar to the Abrahamic ones, and they can be treated within the context of, of, uh, of, of the earlier Muslim, Muslim middle East system. So in, in some way, in many ways, and, and what I will argue is that the Ottoman Empire inherited both, both the Abbasid and the Mongolian one. And we um, underestimate or forget how much of, of a Mongolian legacy that the Ottoman Empire um, had um, when the Ottomans started around the same time, around 1300, in, um, in around this Bursa and in the Balkans as a kind of Muslim imperial tradition uh, of Western Eurasia. Um, in this map, you could see uh, three big so-called medieval Muslim empires, the Ottomans, Mughals, and Safavids. All three of them had the dual lineage of um, both Muslim background and the Mongolian background. And the Ottomans uh, also uh, embraced, and the others did that too, also proudly, the Roman imperial background. Alexander the Great was as important for them as Genghis Khan, and, um, and of, co of course, um, Muhammad. You know, the biggest symbol of this transition is, is, is a gentleman named Tamerlane, who established uh, a big Muslim kingdom, and he claimed to be the grandson of both uh, the princess Alanqua, both Princess Alanqua, the legendary daughter of Genghis Khan, and Prophet Muhammad. You know, you get this double strong legitimacy to claim a universal monarch, and all this, these medieval big Muslim monarch empires, the Safavid. Mughals and the Ottomans, they did have their own versions of managing diversity through Middle They gave um, freedom of religion and association to uh, different uh, minorities. And the, the Ottomans, the success of the Ottomans uh, also comes from their messianic aura, which, which also existed with, with in, in the Mughals as well. And what I mean by messianism, and we have a very good book by Asfar Moin on that regard, uh, on, on um, saintly kingship, is that these monarchs, um, they assume a role above any religion. In, in some ways, they are Muslim, but their legitimacy cannot be reduced to their Muslims. And we have uh, very fantastic pictures uh, that the Mughal um, art showed. And, and one of them, the um, Mughal emperor is, is embracing here um, the Safavid uh, Shah. And you could see the, the kind of imagination of the globe, the idea of a, a, a world peace and harmony in the symbolism of a lion and a lamb that they are standing on. And, and I, I, you know, a lot of us to think that the Middle East system has uh, that strong Muslim traditions of, uh, of treating people of the book uh, in a tolerant way, but we should not underestimate the importance of that kind of a universal monarchical tradition. You could see that in, in the success of, of the greatest, uh, most uh, celebrated Ottoman sultan in the 16th century, Suleiman the Magnificent. Uh, on the one side, you see him with the Muslim, uh, Muslim clothing and some sort of uh, the white turban um, made from the Bursa silk, where I, I, I was born. Uh, that's why that um, turban is, wasn't heavy in many ways, a very soft silk. But on the other hand, you could see his... Um, Roman imperial crown made in Venice. Uh, it, it had more layers than the crown of the pope. And this is what he wore uh, in, his, uh, uh, in his campaign to uh, Vienna. And what he will do on, on, on the way to Vienna, imagine he's, he's going as at, the, at the head of his army with 200,000 soldiers uh, going through predominantly Christian lands of, of um, Serbia or Croatia or Bosnia. And having that crown, or at least the repetition of that crown, is very imp important. That, that he's Muslim, but he also has the inherited this, this uh, amazing uh, Roman imperial legacy. His titles include Khan, the Mongolian Khan, um, or Caesar, um, or, or, or Sultan at the same time. And they would not see any contradictions among um, different aspects of, of this, um, uh, this composite uh, universal legitimacy in, the, in their mind. And thus, if you are a, a Bulgarian or a Greek community under the rule of Suleiman the Magnificent, um, yes, you would know that you're ruled by a Muslim monarch, uh, 
but there's an element of, of Suleiman's aura, uh, or his, his father, his son, is, is that it goes beyond their Muslims, that they are the universal monarch that provides the, the peace and prosperity. And we have um, letters uh, written by these monarchs like Mehmed II, his letters to uh, different church leaders. Uh, we have actually an, an anecdote of Mehmed II visiting a church um, after the conquest of Istanbul. And he's saying that, you know, I am your monarch, whatever you need, um, don't hesitate to get in touch with me, I will take care of it. Um, and in the, in the ideal Millet system, of, of course, Mehmed is, is the one who is above everybody else granting these rights. Um, but Muslims don't know what Mehmed is doing in that church. There's no journalism, um, there's no connections. So Mehmed II or Suleiman could have links with each community, or the Jewish community and others, but then those communities do not have uh, direct links with each other. That, that's very important to keep in mind in the, kind of for the success of the system. There are limits and failures of the Millet system, I should uh, mention, is that it's not, it shouldn't be idealized as a uh, perfect equal citizenship with politically correct uh, behavior of respect and tolerance. Uh, Millet system uh, coexisted with lots of xenophobia, prejudices and bias, racial classifications, um, uh, and so many uh, different famed, uh, uh, forms of, of discrimination. Uh, in the Middle East system, uh, Muslims were still um, a privileged class of citizens. Um, so Middle East system was not, could, could not be compared to today's notions of equal citizenship. It should be judged in its own standards. For example, uh, we have a case of a, of a Jewish uh, jewelry uh, merchant, Kira Eshtar Handali, who was very connected to Suleiman's wife, Roxolana. Um, and uh, the, the ladies in the harem um, did not go out, so they, they, when they wanted to buy a jewelry, they used a family of Jewish merchants to buy their jewelry. And Roxolana herself, as a Ukrainian um, lady from the, from the harem, represents kind of a diversity of the empire and the military system. But in one occasion, you know, uh, uh, there was a, a military rebellion, and they ended up blaming military rebellion based on, on, on the devaluing of the silver coins that the Genesis are paid. Um, and they ended up blaming the, uh, the this Jewish family and then um, asked the execution of, uh, of, of Kira Eshtar Handali. And you could see an element of, of a little bit of anti-Semitism, biases towards Jews, coexisting with the integration of this Jewish family to the Ottoman imperial rule. Similarly, the Millet system, for example, was not... Um, was not tolerant of any collaboration or cooptation or, or sympathy with another empire. Um, it, we have the case of, also they were not um, very tolerant of, of Muslim sects in, in some ways, especially if they are seen uh, threatening. So we have the case of the Alevi Muslims uh, in Anatolia being persecuted during the Middle system because they were seen as collaborators of the Safavid Empire or irrespective of, of their collaboration with the Safavid Empire, they were seen as, as heterodox. Now, I, I will move forward to the 19th century. I will say that this notion of a universal uh, a monarch and the Millet system continued all the way to until 18, 1830s, 40s, um, throughout Eurasia. Um, for example, Napoleon is seen as some sort of a, as a symbol of a nationalist uh, French revolutionary ideals of enlightenment. But when he was in Egypt, I mean, he acts like, a, um, like another uh, Genghis Khan. He acts um, like a medieval universal monarch. And there is a case of, of his, his advisor's negotiation with Al-Azhar um, uh, if, if he should convert to Islam so that he's accepted um, as, a, uh, as a legitimate monarch in Egypt. I mean, they even talked whether it's okay for him to be Muslim but still drink wine and, and not have circumcision. Um, it didn't go anywhere because Napoleon was busy with fighting with the Ottomans and the British, so he would be true. But, um, but he was trying to go to India, and he had his allies in India. Um, his main rival was the British. And there's actually one uh, unknown case that uh, Ottoman has discovered recently that um, the Crimean Khan, uh, Giray Khan, wrote a letter to Napoleon. Um, he was uh, being taken over by Russians, so he asked Napoleon's help against Russia. And Napoleon, when he was on the way to India, he asked his advisors, like, where is, it, where, where is this uh, Genghis Khan's family, Giraiz? Maybe he should be with me 
in case I need him in India, right? I mean, you know, he's still thinking in a very imperial way of, of a universal monarch. Similarly, we, we have um, Captain the Great's uh, universalism um, in, in the late uh, 18, early 19, uh, late 18th century. Um, and, and the transition to uh, the, the last person is Mahmoud II, the Ottoman Sultan is going to be what I'm going to discuss because the, the, the Mahmoud II after the Greek rebellion is, is kind of readjust the Ottoman military system a little bit. Um, once the Greeks wanted to separate from the Ottoman Empire, which is a big shock for the Ottomans because they did rely on the Greeks as the second most privileged group of um, Ottoman subjects. Um, Mahmoud II first put Muslims instead of Greeks into certain diplomatic positions, but then with his reforms, he also reaffirmed the millet system and tried to institutionalize and saying that I am now a civilized empire. I am wearing a Greek hat as the official uniform of the Ottoman Empire, the Fez, uh, adopted from Greeks. Uh, um, and what Mahmoud II did is, is, is that in his travels uh, in the Balkans, and we have this kind of German accounts, these German uh, military advisors, he will pass through the Bulgarian villages, and this first time, he will try to talk to them. He will say, you know, I am your monarch. We are the Ottomans, and, and you know, this is an empire for the Christians, too. And we have these very interesting uh, accounts written by Molke, especially, on, on his attempts to connect with the uh, Christian subjects uh, who are more active now, more, more connected with, with each other in a new way, very different than, than what uh, Suleiman the Magnificent will do. The, 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 his uniform, his attempt to, to be a civilized empire. So during the Greek rebellion, uh, which is kind of a transition in the Ottoman Mille system, we have two very different accounts of the Mille system uh, by two uh, important British Romantic uh, writers. And um, on the left, uh, the person uh, with, with, the, with the mosque, Ayyub Mosque, in the background, he's, he's, he should be known more. He's not well known. He's the inventor of the interior decoration. His name is Thomas Hope. Uh, he wrote, he, he wrote uh, a novel called Anastasius uh, about a Greek girl in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and actually, Lord Byron, the other one is Lord Byron. Lord Byron was an admirer of, of Thomas Hope. And Thomas Hope's accounts of the Ottoman Mille system is very romanticized. He says, this is the best empire in the world. It's not despotic at all. They don't even care what you do. So he kind of uh, uh, praises the Ottoman Mille system as a kind of minimal government, not despotic. And it's a good, good government. The least government is a good government. But on the contrary, uh, we have, uh, again, Lord Byron's account, uh, who supported the Greek revolt, who sees uh, this, this Mille system not working and the Greeks deserving uh, to be independent. And in, in this occasion, we see this transition of, um, of more active uh, Greek elites and publics connected to Russia, connected to European uh, notions of enlightenment and nationalism, asking for independence and, and kind of testing uh, the Mille system. But although it's not the end of it in, in many ways. But what does happen from Greek independence in another 50 years in the Balkans is that more and more Christian publics do want a divorce from the Ottoman Empire. That doesn't mean they are, uh, there was no hope for the Ottoman Empire in the Balkans. You know, this is a, Christian majority part of the empire, but it was the heartland of the empire. Um, and then while this is happening, uh, we see uh, an attempt to keep the Mille system and more self-conscious one through constitutions, through a contractual relationship of Tanzimat and, and, and um, declaring that the empire is going to be more civilized, everybody is equal. So the Ottoman Empire actually uh, perfected the Mille system in the 19th century, but it wasn't working. Uh, for example, they abolished jizya, the, the, the tax on, on non-Muslims, which was a sign of, of, of the inequality between a Muslim subject and a non-Muslim subject. Um, so this was gone in, in, in 18, uh, 18, late 1840s, which was, which was a big transformation. Um, slavery is gone. So in many ways, the empire was becoming a better empire. But then it was not working in, in the sense that there are more and more subjects of the Middle East that wanted to get out. And, and how do we explain uh, this dilemma uh, in the sense that you know, we, I have a picture of the Ottoman constitution declared in 1876 is, is referring to kind of an understanding of the Middle East system, but also promising full equality of citizenship. Um, I think perhaps this dilemma um, can be seen um, by, the, by, 
by these characters. I, I think uh, I, I, I'm running out of time. I'm going to go at least give some sort of glimpses of that. A successful example of the Milner system is, is the most um, beloved Ottoman bureaucrat and ambassador, Musurus Pasha, who was Greek origin, the Ottoman ambassador to London, uh, versus, uh, and this is also the Ottoman Greek diplomat in the Berlin Congress, um, Kara Theodori, versus uh, Krimian, an Armenian uh, patriarch, who then became a symbol of, of the kind of demands of the Armenian, um, uh, more Armenian autonomy and articulation and independence. Um, and I think these two trends uh, continued. But what did happen, uh, let me give you my, my kind of summary in the next five minutes uh, so that we have more time for discussion, is that what did happen is, is the kind of global context of connections, uh, imperial, uh, imperial competition and connections, where um, Christians in the Ottoman Empire tried to get out while more Muslims in other parts of the world becoming subjects of different European empires. This shouldn't have been a problem in a different era. I mean, the, the empires gain territory, lose territory. Um, so we have, for example, Sayyid Ahmed Han, uh, the symbol of Indian Muslims' loyalty to the British Empire. Uh, and Sayyid Ahmed Han introduced Fez uh, in his schools. You know, he's also pro-Ottoman. And in his mind, it's comparable. You know, you could have the British queen uh, as Christian ruling over Muslims, um, as the Ottoman sultan as a Muslim ruling over Christians. So there's still, by 1870s, 1880s, there is some sort of an uh, updated version of the medieval universal empires, that religion shouldn't be a problem, that universalism can be, can be contained. But there's also a, what I call the Glastonian woman, uh, who wrote about 1870s, uh, Ottoman Bulgarian massacres, and it says Bulgarian horrors and the question of the East. And, and Glaston um, formulates this evangelical Christian understanding of an Ottoman Empire as a despotic Muslim Empire oppressing Christian subjects. Now, in that moment, that doesn't mean that there weren't any Bulgarian Christians who were uh, discriminated or oppressed or killed. And, and I think the Ottoman government recognized that. There was the phenomenon of Bashi Bozuks. American journalists wrote about that. There was a there was a big campaign in, in, in England and other places to help the victims of what we call uh, Bashi Bozuk Muslim guerrillas who are seemingly punishing innocent <coughs> Bulgarian peasants uh, for uh, supporting nationalists. But the story was much complicated because Gladstone was also um, a British prime minister, even though he's liberal, and then Britain was ruling over even then 80 million Muslims. So if you want um, Bulgarian independence and support the Bulgarian Christians, how do you justify that you rule over more and more Muslims? And then Muslims in India and other places began to kind of articulate their demands by making new connections to the Ottoman Empire, by saying that the Ottoman Empire is actually a better empire than the, uh, the British because as Muslims and Hindus, we don't have any um, rights, we don't have any ministers, but look at the Ottoman Empire, they have a Greek minister, Armenian minister, so they, they began to kind of compare the empires and, and try to make the scene, make the scene very much more complex. Thus, after 1877-78 wars, when the Ottoman Empire lost uh, the majority of its Christian subjects um, with, as a result of this war, um, it became more Muslim. So that finally, uh, the Ottoman Empire is 80% Muslim. Um, and then, uh, according to Dominic Lieber, I think he said this, this could have been an opportunity for the Ottoman Empire because they can redefine the empire in a more nationalistic term. Then it's actually, it, it could make it work better compared to Russians and austria hungarians because they had more, more populations who were different than the Sultan's uh, monarch's religion. I mean, British Empire, for example, was a Christian minority empire, if you think Victoria is an empress. Um, it's in that context, Abdulhamid II kept the Milnes system but also um, made the empire more Muslim. Um, and the, the certain dilemmas, I think, is, is kind of originating from, from this moment, where we get this bizarre map of, um, uh, of, of globalization and interconnected publics of Muslim populations of, in different empires. All of them began to look at the Ottoman capital, Istanbul, as, uh, as the seat of the caliph. But, if you look at the, the empires ruling over Muslims, you see that the Ottomans are in number, number five. 
um, according to this Christian missionary map of the Muslim world. Um, but the Ottomans, what they, what they end up doing in order to, being aware of their weakness, in order to strengthen um, their empire internationally, they foster this relationship with other Muslims that are living under the rule of European empires, not to create jihad or confrontation, but to tell uh, the British Empire that we should not fight with each other. You need to support my uh, integrity and sovereignty because I have the caliph that rules, that has spiritual sovereignty over the 100 million Muslims you're ruling over. So they create this notion of a Ottoman Empire keeping the Middle system, but also having spiritual authority over the Muslims ruled by other empires, other European empires. So there's some sort of new element of re-regionalization and a new concept of civilization, race, the Muslim world, overlapping with the imperial relationship. And this makes, uh, and this has something to do with, of course, the, the great um, connections created by steamships and print and journalism and telegraph, that the, the publics are not separated by empires. They are more interconnected across empires, which makes um, the demarcation across the Middle system very difficult. Uh, and thus, uh, even though the, this attempt was made to keep the monarchs very universal, we see Queen Victoria with her favorite butler, a Muslim from India, Abdul Karim, in, in the last 10 years. Um, Abdul Karim became a, a real important figure in, in the Buckingham Palace. And on the one hand, you can see Queen Victoria actually symbolizing that universal empire in the Middle East system. You know, you have your Indian butler, and he's Muslim. He has a mosque in the, in the palace. Um, he cooks halal curry for the queen. He teaches her Urdu so she can talk uh, in many ways. But, the, but her son and everybody else in the palace hate Abdul Karim. You know, what's this Muslim doing? And there's all these big occasions where queen wants to take Abdul Karim to um, her vacation in Paris. And everybody revolts, you don't take them. And, and then Queen says, you British, you don't understand, you're all racist. She's German, right? So um, <laughs> in, in some ways. And we can see Abdul Hamid, you know, he's, he's, uh, his image changes in the 1890s as an oppressor of Armenians. There's an Armenian revolt. But he's also, uh, his favorite bureaucrats are, are also still Greeks and Armenians. He does foster these kind of relationship. And then Abdul Hamid and the Queen um, do want to keep that kind of an imperial world order like, uh, through an Ottoman British cooperation. But it's, it's not working because there are all, all these issues of race is there, issues, issues of active publics, independence, nationalism. Um, that leads to, uh, I'm going to skip, is, is, is to the Young Turk Revolution and, and a kind of redefinition of the Middle East system. Um, to, since this is a very, uh, educated audience who knows what happened in World War I and Armenian genocide and the Greek-Turkish population exchange. Let me then um, summarize. I, 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 will, I don't mean to say, now, as a conclusion, that Millet's system or this kind of imperial universalism and diversity was doomed to fail. Um, for example, Bosnian Muslims who were uh, coming under the rule of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, um, in fact, had an opposite tendency. They became more loyal to the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So we could have, these empires could have a longer life. In, in, the, in their case, of course, they are afraid of a Serbian domination. So initially, they were very against Austro-Hungarians. They, they wanted to go back to the Ottomans. But once they realized they are not going back to the Ottoman Empire and afraid of the Serbians, there are more and more Bosnian Muslims are actually uh, invested in the, in the, in the, the Middle East system of the Austro-Hungarian Austro Empire. So the shot just before... Uh, uh, Archduke was, was assassinated, is actually he's in, in the city hall meeting with the Muslim leaders. And we could see the Gavrilo Prince's uh, killing of the, uh, of the crown prince uh, is actually is also a, a shooting against the Middle system, right? That, that Bosnian Muslims are making Bosnia more loyal to, to the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So there's, even in World War I, you, you could see there's a chance that this could, this could survive, but also World War I actually makes it not to survive. These pictures I took from Bosnia, I lost it. Um, so when the Ottoman Empire en enters into World War I um, and declares jihad, I think that is the end of the Middle East system in many ways. I mean, why would a 
Why would the monarch of a civilized empire with Greek and Armenian populations declaring holy war against an empire rules 10 times more Muslims than the Ottomans did, right? Two, several empires ruled more Muslims. And that, that's why the, in, in, in the Gallipoli, you could see that the Armenians and Greeks are in the Ottoman army um, fighting for the Ottoman Empire, but at the same time, the Ottoman government is trying to do ethnic cleansing of the Armenians away from the Russian borderland. So we, we, we see this kind of very confused scenes of the end of the Middle system in, in, in World War I. Uh, maybe I will end it here to, to kind of get a sense of why Middle system succeeded or failed in this long 19th century. Um, and, and when we are thinking about this legacy, I think we should avoid this romanticization. It wasn't a perfect system. Uh, keep it as a, some sort of a, a question of, of managing diversity in very diverse empires. Uh, sees successes, but sees, sees also we should see its inevitable failures in the age of steamships and telegraph and journalism um, uh, and active publics. Um, and, 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 and learn lessons what, about what nationalism inherited from these middle systems and what they rejected um, against them. Thank you very much. We are open for discussion. Oh, first discussion and then one. Oh, okay. Let me start. So, a um, couple of things that you mentioned that make the uh, make it difficult for the Miller system to operate within the modern context. The first one is you mentioned desacralization, right? Uh, that somehow the uh, Miller system does have to rely on vertical relationship as opposed to horizontal ones, right? You also thought that the ability of connecting across imperial borders, that is Muslim population or Christian populations, which live in other empires, is a problem with globalization somehow. And also you were pointing to the fact that it's an illiberal form of multiculturalism in that it assumes uh, that there's only limited contact or limited exchanges between the different communities that enjoy the type of autonomy. And I would have added something else that emerges very uh, strongly, I think, in the last part, and that is nationalization, which I think yeah. them all is something that that makes it import that makes it difficult, right? Mm -hmm. And I I wanted to think whether I mean there are, as you pointed out, both in the Ottoman Empire, but especially in Austria Hungary, where an attempt to modernize yeah. this type of system, right? With the imperial official attempting to make to arrange those yeah. relationships in, in varieties of compromises amongst the different people. Do all of those elements make it impossible mm. for something like a military system to operate within the context of a modern state? So that's, that's the... Uh, yeah, no, that, that, that's a big question. Is, that, is there anything that is uh, redeemable or... Uh, Word preserving from that old system in the in the age of modern citizenship. Um, the, the the big question, of course, is that is Miller system then uh, doomed to create uh, segregation? You know, separate but equal. Right? You, you, if you take the American uh, formula, um, meaning that if all these individuals um, could they they are right as equal citizens, independent of their millet. Would that contradict the arrangement of, of a middle system? I mean, is there a successful case case of that? The difference between the individual citizens and the collective communal identity, yeah, yeah. right? Well, that's the I mean, the closest I lived in Malaysia for some time. The closest I can think of is, is actually Malaysia, um, still keeping some sort of, uh, of of a notion of an old middle system. But then, uh, but if I if you were a Chinese in Malaysia, mm -hmm. you know. That's not a pleasant system for you because there are limits of how you can, how much you can, you can, you can go up, um, and uh, you know the Malays even were very republican. They want to keep the monarchs that were frozen and protected by the British Empire for a long time, uh, because the monarchs kind of ensure that, irrespective of uh, these sultans who, or some of them, are uh, ridiculously inept on anything. They, they have some, some symbolic power, but it, it kind of symbolizes that there's still a Muslim country with a Muslim sultan. 
And then that goes back to, you know, I, I, my last thing was, that can America create an imperial military system? I mean, it, it, all the discussion about Obama uh, and his, uh, his, his Muslim father and, and, uh, and what it symbolizes in America. You could, you could symbolize this, it symbolizes the kind of uh, citizenship and it, almost uh, a universal emperor, right? That, that he has, you couldn't even manufacture somebody like that in a lab. Like he has connections to Indonesia and Africa and, and other places, <laughs> and Hawaii. Um, but then look what happens in, in terms of the active publics. And we have this kind of response and reaction that this is our country, it's a Christian white country. And, and, and the hatred that, 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 that become obvious. And then the elder responses. So I, I, I want to keep the question open and think more about this, at least. So you kept saying there's something more than Muslims. You were doing the court system, yeah. the comparative court system, and the cross time. It's very interesting. But I was sort of thinking of the fact that when you keep, when you're reaching for somebody to talk about more than Muslimness, but you hesitate at a threshold of Islamicity. Is that because you're an anti-Chicago person at Harvard and <laughs> uh, Chicago never talked, or is it you don't find uh, Hodgsonian terminology yeah. useful? Or Islamicity also goes with Persian aid, and then you have to complicate Ottoman. Catholicism even more by saying actually it's Persian aid rather than yeah, right. so I, I know, just a slight question about no that's good I actually yeah we can get more questions I, I started with Genghis Hando you know should, should say. Well, can I piggyback, piggyback on that I, I wanted to ask if um, you know uh, you're using the idea of military system as a sort of um, a broader ca category and a more generic uh, yeah. sort of framework um, uh, but I wanted to ask if there's something that you also see as a distinct, what are the distinctive properties of the Ottoman millet system? Um, obviously it changes o over mm -hmm. time, but you know, what would you say would be the, the main takeaways for then thinking about, um, as I do in my work, sort of attempts today to appropriate and invoke mm -hmm. um, the Ottoman system in Turkey towards um, yeah. different types of uh, illiberal management of diversity. So is it no, what is I'm going to... I'm going to keep, I, I want to get to that question, but we should maybe take one more question before, uh, um, do you want to respond to this? And yeah, well, well, again, it should be seven three, and we do have some time, so go ahead. Okay. Uh, in terms of the distinctive uh, ones, and I think going back to the Genghis Khan, the Mongolian legacy, I will, in, initially I was trying to see, tell how Tamerlane and the Ottomans and the Mughals and stuff, but also kind of merged Islamicate and Genghis Khan, the Mongolian one. And then I merged them with the, with the European imperial tradition. So the multiple imperial traditions kind of help produce the synthesis of, of the millet system. Islamicate may be the right term, you know, uh, or Genghisicate, maybe, the, who, who knows. But, uh, uh, but with the Ottoman ones, I, I, what is unique? I thought about this in the connection between, uh, kind of comparison between these two ladies, Roxelana and Joda, Akbar's wife. So Akbar's wife in the Mughal Empire, when she came to marry Akbar, she did not. Uh, have to convert to Islam. She remained as Hindu. And of course, it's, a, it's an amazing act of justification because this is a kind of Muslim minority um, empire, right? That the Hindus are majority. Uh, and so she had her own temple. No Muslim objected to that. I mean, I think you know more about this. I don't, there, there's, of course, the modern Indian nationalism made great deal. That's okay. Most That's okay. They call her uh, the Mary of our age. So they tried yeah. to kind of made it made her like a Mary, it's this innocence of Mary. Um, in the Ottoman context, of course, it's hard to imagine that kind of a comparable thing. I mean, the first Byzantine princess, Nilufer, um, they, they all had to become Muslim. They can't remain mm -hmm. as, uh, as, uh, as Hindu, right? And because I, I think there is, in that sense, in, in the Ottoman Empire, the, the, the Muslim component in the, in the, in the synthesis was, has always been stronger. And I think part of the reason is, is these uh, wars with the Habsburgs. Mm -hmm. And I, I wonder whether the, the Habsburg propaganda became then internalized by the Ottomans in the sense that in Vienna, in, in the Battle of Vienna, we know that the, the Ottomans were fighting to protect the Hungarian Protestants, right? I mean, this war cannot be Islam versus Christianity. It's actually, when you think about it, the Protestants versus Catholics, right? They, you're fighting for the Protestants. Mm -hmm. But then Habsburgs, when they have the second Vienna victory, they use it so well, you know, to embarrass the French, that we are, we are defending Christian Europe against the Muslim threat. Um, and, I, and I always wonder whether this, uh, there are many, uh, many other reasons, but this helped 
to make the Muslimness of the Ottoman Empire even stronger. Because it's not a, a stable thing. It's also not linearly increasing or decreasing. It, it increases, it decreases. Um, as, 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 for example, in the Tanzimat, uh, it happens after the Greek revolt. All the Greek bureaucrats are purged from diplomacy because the, and also the patriarch was, execu was, it was executed. I mean, when you think about the failure of the military system, Mahmoud II doesn't know what to do with the Greek revolt because he can, he's not capable of understanding nationalism. He blames the patriarch. He says, you know, your millet, who are these people? Why, are, why aren't you doing anything? And patriarch has nothing to do with the Greek nationalists. And poor guy is, is executed. Um, and that's a clear violation of the failure of the millet system. But then Mahmoud II turns around and, and then he, he tries to uh, modernize the millet system, right? The, the equals, especially his son, uh, Abdul Majid with the Tanzimat, that no distinctions among the subjects, all subjects are equal. It even becomes better. So it's, it's very zigzag in, in, in many ways. And uh, th there's this moment in 1869, and I think um, Sarkar was asking me why I, I, I mentioned this so many times, that this moment when um, uh, Sultan Abdulaziz is visiting London, and there's this offer from the Israeli, uh, 1869, that why don't we make the Ottoman crown prince marry one of the daughters of Queen Victoria? So a great offer. Um, and you know, that will collect Queen Victoria's collection, right? I mean, she's the grandmother of all the monarchs in Europe at that time. Uh, now, um, and Ottomans are puzzled. I mean, Disraeli is more universalist. I mean, he, he, he's, he's the one who actually made Victoria the Empress of India, the Kayseri Hind. Um, and the Ottoman Sultan's response is like, you know, how am I gonna, even then, he, he said, how am I gonna tell them that the caliph's wife is Christian? Because you can't ask a British princess to convert to Islam. They, they realize that. And he's really worried about that. You know, we can't have a caliph sultan whose wife is, is a British Christian princess. So there, there is some sort of a the stronger Muslim identity, even back in 18th century, but becoming stronger over time. Can I just say one thing that strengthens your argument you didn't mention is the Second of Assembly, the Kurdish Union in 1869, that defining groups that they conquer and that they rule by religion. Yeah. And the Ottomans knew about that. There's all kinds, as you know. Yeah. I think the idea that religion trumps uh, location, tribe, Heritage becomes something Protestant. You mentioned Protestants. Protestants think this is the, this is the be all and end all, not not your identity in other regards. So I think the religion label comes up systemically, not just in court systems, yeah. from the middle of the nineteenth century on. Yeah, that's true. Uh, the kind of there's the global Muslim racialization that that is very important. So if you, your question. Uh, I'll, I'll let, my question is totally anachronistic, and it, and it deals with women under the Nile system. Um, because, as we all know, when you allow each religious group to run its own affairs, women are not going to come out well. Um, but uh, that might be a question to wait until the next year. But no, but there, uh, this is a great question. I think there should be more research on this. Is, is that the Miller system did not mean that people lived in separate containers and didn't interact. Interaction is, is tremendous. And one way of interaction is, is the legal system. So a lot of women... At, at least from what I read, is, is, is if you're if it's a Greek, Armenian, or Jewish woman, and you cannot get a divorce in your own court, they 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 began to use um, Muslim judges for divorce because it's easier to get um, a divorce through a Muslim judge. Uh, there are a couple of categories; some of them are very um, misogynist, but nevertheless, it's, uh, those categories can be utilized to get your divorce. So it seems that, uh, that there was a lot of interactions among the Middle system and, and, and people. Little people knew how to manipulate, at least legally, uh, their their position. Um, the, uh, the gender in the Middle system probably should be studied more in, in that regard. Um, and then and the, and the interactions among the millets. You know, the whole um, symbol is of course the baklava battle, right? The, who who makes who owns the baklava brand, right? That that's the uh, Greeks or the Lebanese or the Turks. But that, that is shows that the Middle system at, the, at least created a common cuisine. Um, and we have one beautiful article that I, I recommend anybody who, who's using um, Ottoman histories uh, by uh, Rachel Goshkarian about the cuisine, Armenian cuisine in, in Eastern Anatolia. And she argues that they practically had the same food. But then Armenians wanted to add pork in it to distinguish their version of the food. So there's some sort of a element of, of similarity, connections, and sharing, uh, but then on the other hand also emphasizing 
but you're a little bit different, and, and the pork symbolizes your difference now. Yes. No, that, that's, that's a great question in, in the sense that um, under the Millet system, the, this additional tax that non-Muslims paid, it, when it was abolished, it was almost 20% of the Ottoman budget. So it was not uh, an insignificant amount, and it's impressive that they abolished it, right? That, that the Muslim jurists came up with a fatwa saying that in underneath modern con uh, considerations, um, this is irrelevant. Actually, it's around the same time in Tunisia and in the Ottoman Empire, they also um, created Muslim juridical opinion against slavery. So, you know, with the British campaign against slavery, they also the Muslims kind of made their own internal arguments that the slavery is wrong, uh, according to Islam. Um, although it wasn't fully abolished. But the jizya was abolished. And, you know, there is an element of, of the Ottoman modernism, Muslim modernism, the, the fez-bearing caliph and the fez-bearing Muslims um, are doing that. But once they abolished the... Uh, um, these taxes, and then the, the other side of it is just maybe not directly related to that. Is that also that Christians now were required to uh, go to the, to serve in the army, which they served, and there there is this kind of uh, problem. They said, look, why don't we just give an exemption tax so we don't serve in the army? Um, and from that perspective, by the way, I I, I, I fall into the middle system category because I paid so that I don't serve in the army. Right? That's a now they're, they're the rich Turks are almost this kind of rich millet system is that they pay out of the army and then it's almost this year 200,000 people apparently could pay $10,000 each. It's a huge amount of money uh, to exempt themselves from, from the military service. Um, I, I think um, in, in some ways, you know, from starting from taxation and in the Ottoman millet system towards the late 19th century with the, uh, with the capitulations on equal treaties, there is this complaint that the Armenians and Greeks are financially better. They are this um, uh, merchant bourgeoisie with, ha with double passports. And, and they have the embassy passports, so they benefit from European capitulations. Um, and then they create this gap between, at least in perception. It, in reality, it might be different. I think we now know that there were a lot of Muslim merchants to it, and there might have been kind of a discursive way of describing it. it, it so the, the Muslim argument is that all the bourgeoisie is Christian because they are supported by foreign powers. They're all Christian too. We don't know how accurate this was. I, I, I wish that people do research on to see who were the richest people in the Ottoman Empire, which background did they come from. Is that really true? It might also be some sort of like the, imagining the Jews are the richest in Germany. It's got to be a kind of anti xenophobic trend to always single out the rich Greeks and the Armenians. Because there were so many poor Armenians and all these people who were um, who were killed in the genocide, they were not. You know, you can't really claim that they were rich. They were just peasants and you know, farmers. They're no different. But that 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 economic thing then became uh, a reason for the untangling and also destruction of the Middle East system by the Turkish nationalists, saying that um, there was something wrong with the Tanzimat, uh, coupled with European imperialism. That's why we need to get rid of the Christians and create a homogenous nation state. And so the Ataturk, um, who was born in Thessaloniki in the most diverse place of the empire, created the most boring and homogenous nation state. We're, similarly, Venizelos, who, who was born in Crete, uh, which is almost half Muslim, half, half Greek population, 
did the reverse, right? Did they agreed to exchange populations to get rid of the millet system to create homogenous nation states. Um, you've suggested that for, uh, for, for a universalist empire, one needs an expensive geography and kind of loose communication. Mm. And I think I find it very important because that I think makes it possible for the subjects, even the rulers, to harbor contradictions as they sort of yeah. move around. So they're not hard pressed to resolve these contradictions all at once and to become one and the same yeah. thing. So I, uh, but something happens in the 19th century, the uh, sort of Stalin with the, Stalin with the telephone and uh, uh, Abdul Hamid with the telegraph. Telegraph, yeah. Yeah, and uh, uh, Victoria with the steamship. With the steamship. And with that, the, I mean, th this is a moment of glo globalization and where you kind of lose that uh, ability to sort of harbor these contradictions in expansive geographies. This geography doesn't have to be in, in the framework of universal empire. It could be Indian Ocean, yeah. the Hadam, for example. But overall, in the 19th century, there's this broader structural technological change that really makes it, it seems, yeah. a little difficult, harder for um, both the, I mean, we have Ghazan Khan, uh, you know, converting to Islam, maybe just to kind of disarm the Memluk yeah. you know, sort of uh, resistance, or we have Suleiman with a Roman head. I don't know if these things could be done today, you yeah. know, if, can you just so move, because become example, one person or the other as you move around? So I thought about this, Napoleon, for example, you know, how sincere we don't know, but there's this conversation happening with the ulama of al Assar, right? Could he convert? Well, what, will he, what will he do if he goes back to Paris as a general? Like how, he can't really explain that I had this deal of it, I'm also Muslim, right? You know, you, <laughs> you can. But um, Ghazan Khan has no chance of going back to Karakorum. He's in Iran, and it takes so long. His wife, uh, Blue Princess of Bayout, actually uh, was sent for, uh, for his uncle uh, initially as a wife. But by the time he arrives in, in Iran, his uncle died, so he marries Ghazan Khan. It's so long. I mean, you know, the, the Mongol Empire, the communication is, 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 takes a long time. And I think that argument made, was made by the kind of uh, failure of the British Empire um, in India, the, the, the William Darlimpel's argument about the white Mughals. And so the early, early East India Company, the, all the white British men who marries with Muslim and Hindu women, and they wear the turban, and they look like Mughals. But once steamships makes it faster for the ladies to go to India. Once the British woman goes to India, that's a different story. Then they, they began to separate the British administrative quarters from the natives because the woman then takes charge um, of it. And that may be the end of the British, imagined British middle system in India, right? That they are, they are contractual. They're actually taking over the Mughal Empire. But, but then the, the British Empire became more racialized in India towards the 19th century because of, of the steam power of the steamships. Yeah, really, because you made that not only possible but necessary with the opening of the Suez Canal. Yeah. But that's how this, the, the distance between England and India collapsed yeah. yeah. in, in the latter part of the 19th century. Okay. Let's take just one more question here. I have a related question. So <coughs> I'm thinking of the French Empire when, when during the king of the late, uh, you could say, the Third Republic, let's say the Third Republic, uh, when modernization Technology happened and the creation of black power came to light for the French Empire, the Republican Party, I think maybe the two ideas sort of mixed a little bit. Then I guess you know what happened. So the Miller system had trouble with with this this new transitional system happening yeah. in, in the French Empire. So I'm, the big question is why did the empire fail and so on? Which yeah. I mean, the French Empire is a great example, too. We always assume that they, they were not doing as good as the British, but it's not true. I mean, they do have the, uh, you know, British always be proud that we are the greatest Mohammedan empire. Um, William Blunt actually said, you know, once the autumn, when, when the Ottomans lost in 1878, there was this moment where, you know, what will happen to young Abdul Hamid? So there were these alternatives. And in one alternative that the French Empire taught is to get Abdul Qadir there former enemy in Algeria who was in Damascus. And they were telling him, like, if the Ottoman Empire failed, would you be the emperor of the Arabs under our protection? And Abdul Qadir is, is puzzled. He's like, I'm not going to go against the caliph, but if the caliph is gone, maybe I will do it. So you, know, you can still think the very imperial <coughs> calculations. You know, you just get 
your enemy that you defeated is now in Algeria, in, in Damascus, as, as, the, as the Muslim monarch. Blunt also says that if a European monarch goes to Mecca and converts to Islam, he will fulfill the dream of Napoleon, he says. I mean, this is 1878, is, is you know, almost uh, 70. So 1870, they still think very, in, in terms of Ghazan Khan, but then something changes afterwards. You can think that way. I was going to show the one, um, uh, my favorite uh, uh, thing about the French Empire, one of the books is, is, is a biography of Prophet Muhammad written in Paris uh, by Ibrahim Dinet, one uh, French convert, one, uh, one Algerian uh, Muslim. That biography of Muhammad is the first book that talks about Islamophobia as a term in French. In English translation, it says the fear of Muslims or the uh, you know, prejudice against Muslims. The book complains about Islamophobia, but it's dedicated to Muslims who died for the French Empire in World War I. And the main argument is, is that it's our empire, France is a Muslim empire, but the whites and the Christians don't understand the Muslims. They are, uh, they are fanatical and prejudiced. And, and the pictures in the books are fascinating because it talks about Muhammad's biography, but they imagine Prophet Muhammad had something like an Ottoman flag. So the flag is like, there's some sort of a secret Ottoman sympathies in the book. Nevertheless, it's a loyalist one. And it's, it's a very contradictory in that regard. And, and have to think about the failure of the empire. Wonderful.